Ephesians chapter 4, we find in verse number 10 that Jesus is far above all. That the chaos and the riots and political parties don't bother him at all. Uh, the Bible says in verse 10, he that, is, he that descended is the same also that ascended. There's a, there's a good sermon right there. Um, but he descended, he is also ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So he's way above everything that's happening now. Um, he is all powerful, all knowing, all uh, wise. But he did make a way to make a connection to him. He made a way for us to still um, have a personal relationship with him. So how can lowly man have a relationship with the high God? He does that through people. He uses people to make a connection to himself, to other people. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So how do we connect to God? Yes, yes, we connect through Jesus Christ, but God uses people to establish that connection. He uses people to tell that, to uh, explain that and help with that connection. What does it produce? Verse 12, uh, for the perfecting of the saints, so it helps us to become more sanctified. For the work of the ministry, so that we can work amongst ourselves and uh, advance the cause of Christ. And then for the edifying of the body of Christ. So it makes us perfect, helps us work in the ministry, and helps us edify others. And how long will this continue? Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Uh, so it's not going to stop until Christ comes back or... We were put in the grave, so it's going to continue all the way through, whether retired or just beginning, whether an old Christian or a new Christian. It's going to continue to produce unity, knowledge, become a perfect man, uh, so that we can measure up to Christ, which is a pretty high standard, um, because we have a tendency to be tricked and sin and be misunderstood and misunderstand because there are battles that we're going to face, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children. And actually, there's nothing wrong with being a child because the Bible says become a little child to accept Christ and to uh, get and to uh, accept the gospel. But we should grow. We should mature. That we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. And how do we do this? What's our goal? Our goal is to be like Christ. And our method is to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So that's our goal. We're, again, Christ is up here. People are down here, which is including me. But there's people in the middle of that. And so we are always trying to get more like Christ. And how do we do that? It's really encapsulated in that small phrase, speaking the truth in love. That's the method of helping people and myself to get more like Christ. Um, and we all do this. This isn't a matter of, well, I'm the director, and so I'm, I'm the director of the mission, or I'm the pastor of the church, and so I am here in this spot, and then all these other people are down here, and Christ is up here, and so I'm constantly just bringing people up. Actually, um, I find myself spending just as much time here learning from others and having them minister to me than I do this way, even though... My position is more in the middle, but that's what verse 16 teaches. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Each one of us have a unique ability and talent to help all of us together. Uh, others, uh, uh, realizing that others are going to come and join us in this endeavor, supplying the things that we cannot. We've said this every time we've had the seminar, uh, but um, there are seats that are empty that are going to be filled prayerfully in the next two or three years by more missionaries yeah. joining BPS, joining Scandinavians, joining uh, Careers for Christ, and they will supply something that we cannot right now. Um, and we want that. We want the ministry to go to yeah. grow. So it's all about relationships, relationships. So the first thing is relationships are based on affinity. I try to get A's for my main points. So <laughs> affinity. What I'm talking about is commonality, sharing, uniformity, similarity, um, where uh, 
It's true, opposites attract, but there's a reason why there's not a Catholic priest sitting here. <laughs> okay? I mean, let's be honest. Uh, uh, there's a reason why uh, people who promote Hollywood are not here. Uh, there's probably not many Democrats. Brother Kim? No? Okay. <laughs> I'm worried. I'm worried. Um, uh, where were you yesterday? I, I asked you to pray, and you weren't there, and everybody else was. No. <laughs> you told me I didn't have to come. <laughs> uh, it, it is true that opposites attract. However, um, I married my wife because we were heading in the right direction, heading the same direction. Um, I married her because we had a lot of things in common. How do relationships start? It's because there's common ground that you share. Uh, how do relationships continue? It's because you have common ground. Uh, Amos chapter three, verse three, can two walk together except they be agreed? So generally speaking, relationships are founded upon and relationships continue based upon what you share in common. Shared goals, shared boundaries, shared adventures, shared events, shared experiences, uh, shared laughter, shared anger, uh, all these things, shared emotions, for relationships to continue, you have to maximize what you have in common, okay? Um, the second thing is relationships grow through addition. Addition. That would be contributions, input, what that other person provides to the relationship, what that other per person provides to the relationship. Now, I'm going to say something that sounds like the opposite of what I just said. Um, relationships are based on affinity, and relationships to grow have to have shared goals and adventures and boundaries and events and all that. However, when you get down into the microcosm of two people, they are fundamentally rooted in differences, or we'll say uniqueness. Okay. They're, 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 uh, I'll give you the example, okay, as a husband and wife. That wife, my wife, is different than me, not an addition or replacement of me. And, I, and I'll ex yeah. show this example. So uh, a lot of people look at marriage, and I, and I often find myself kind of defaulting to this illustration. Let's say that um, uh, uh, I've got Brother Josh out there. He's got a business, and we'll, we'll give him this as example. So he's got this successful business, and he wants to grow that business, okay? He wants that business now not to just build houses in the Winnebago County area, but he wants to grow up into a Green Bay area. And he realizes that he's, he needs to have more workers. So he finds someone who is, who is a good builder, uh, knows how to do con con uh, contracts and construction, obviously, but general contracting and so on. He's familiar with codes and all that. And so he finds someone who is similar to him to now form the same company, but now a bigger company over in a Green Bay. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. Okay? That's a fairly good business model. But the problem is, is that that's not how marriage works. Okay, <laughs> lots of people look for what they already have, what they're already good at, what they're already successful in. And so basically, they're just looking for a replacement of themselves. I was talking to a pastor a couple years ago, and he was saying that he was struggling to find a youth pastor. He'd interviewed a lot of people and had a lot of talks with different folks, and he couldn't find any youth pastor uh, that uh, he could settle on. And he said, yeah, the problem is, is that they just don't think like me. <laughs> so, okay. Um, and uh, he said, yeah, I mean, I, I talked to them and they have a little bit different philosophy here and a little bit different opinion there, a little bit different opinion there. He said, you know what I should do is just hire myself. And he was kind of joking, but not really. But that's sad. Yeah. It shows a very small view of how relationships actually work. So if we go back to the illustration of the business, and we'll say that, we'll, we'll use Josh for example, just because he's sitting right in front of me, but um, he has a business, but let's say, and, and I, I'm assuming he's good at accounting, but let's just say he's not very good at accounting, that his business is successful, 
but his side is the people uh, side of things and the hands-on and he can he can build and he can work with the contractors he knows the language but man he gets home and he hates that office work just can't stand it i mean just like pulling teeth to do that where he would be wise is to find someone to help him where he is deficient where he's different where that person can add value to his uh to his business you see uniqueness is oftentimes the source of conflict but uniqueness is the source of success uniqueness is oftentimes disguised we're still under addition okay i won't be different because that might produce conflict it's oftentimes despised no one really cares and it's ignored because anyone can do my job wives say look all you want is a housekeeper anybody can be a housekeeper what makes me unique why did you marry me why did you choose that assistant pastor why did you choose that particular helper because they're unique have you ever felt like you're in a position as a servant to a follower or to a, to a leader and felt like anybody could do what I'm doing? What makes me unique? So your uniqueness is being despised, and that's not good. Sometimes uniqueness is disturbing to somebody else. I can't stand the way they do that different. I can't stand the way that they are. Their personality, they're slow to make a decision, or they're quick to make a decision, or whatever. So it's disguised or despised or disturbing but ultimately, we have to realize that uniqueness is designed by God. Right. It is a design by God. So it should be, we're still under addition, it should be consented. Allow people to be different. It should be celebrated. I'm glad that they're different. Now, that's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm really glad that they make quick decisions. Ugh. I'm really glad that they vacuum the rug all over the place and not in a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> but not only consented and celebrated, it should be incorporated. Well, they can be different so long as they're not different around me. You can manage that side of things. I just won't look at it. I'll tolerate it. It should be incorporated. Um, I would hope that his new accountant would actually help him become a better person, better boss. Uh, the whole company becomes better because of that. Uniqueness produces value. Why is gold valuable? Because it's unique. Why are diamonds valuable? Uh, because they choke the market <laughs> and, produce, <laughs> and produce uniqueness. Uh, but ultimately, that's really what produces value. The more unique, the more valuable. So we have uh, relations are based on affinity, but relationships grow through addition. But number three, this produces adversity. This produces adversity. You can turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. And we have conflict. We have conflict. Now, I've heard sermons that Paul was wrong and Barnabas was right. <laughs> I have also heard sermons yes. <laughs> that Paul was right and Barnabas was wrong. <laughs> and I've had lots of people amen both sides. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't. But the fact is, is there was conflict. And Barnabas, verse 37, and Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus and Paul chose Silas and so on. You ever had a conflict? You ever had a conflict? So did Paul. Simple misunderstandings, mistakes, forgetfulness. Um, I'll just share a quick illustration. So I come down from the pulpit yesterday at, 4 or at the 4 p.m. service. And no, no, sorry, it was 11 a.m. Actually, it was 11 a.m. And there was yeah, quite a few people in the auditorium. Uh, so I came down and he was sitting behind where I was going to sit. And I just introduced Edwin to sing. Okay. Uh, now Edwin had sang for the 8 a.m. And then he was going to sing for the 11 a.m. 
So I came down and I looked at him and I was thinking of making a joke about the second time he preached. Like, oh, this is the second time. I hope it's a lot better, et cetera, you know. But I'm like, you know what? I, whatever. I, I'm not going to worry. He's, he's a lot better at making jokes in the pulpit. Pastor Longstein is. I just don't. I, usually I don't, I don't do it good. But so I didn't say anything there. But when I came down, I, I, the last thing I said was, uh, Brother Edwin's going to come and sing. I came down. And then I looked at him and I said, I hope the second time is better than the first. <laughs> now, I know. Did, did you know what I meant? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who was I talking about? You were, no, you were talking about my sermon. Right, right. <laughs> I knew that. Yeah. And he knew that. But when I said, and he chuckled and I chuckled and I sat down and I thought, you know what? <laughs> There's like 10 people around. <laughs> <laughs> probably what did they think they probably thought I was talking about Edwin do you, know what um, I said? Yeah. do you know what I said to you what did you say I said I hope I, I hope it does too <laughs> I hope it is too <laughs> by the way both times are fantastic really good um, uh, and it is interesting you hear the second time a little bit different emphasis and so on but um, simple misunderstandings I mean I love Edwin to death and I thought he did a great job uh, both times but just the simple misunderstanding can produce conflict, okay? Uh, uh, different backgrounds and personalities. Do you suppose a child who grew up in the middle of eight and they marry somebody who is an only child? Do you suppose there could be conflict? Uh, do you suppose that um, somebody, uh, somebody who grew up in a very rich home and then a very poor home and got married, do you think there would be conflict on how they come to decisions? Uh, do you think somebody who is educated at a master's level degree and marries somebody who is a high school dropout would have conflict? Of course. Uh, different backgrounds and personalities, just the simple mistakes that happen in life like happened yesterday. Um, uh, then different ways that people work out a problem. Some people have to, have to have a conclusion as soon as possible. Some people have to have time to work it out. My wife is far more like that than me. She wants to have time. She wants to think about it. She wants to meditate on it. She wants to mull about it. And I'm like, hey, no better time than to make a decision right now. <laughs> I mean, I just like to make decisions fairly quickly. How about different ways people talk? It took me a long time to realize this, and I, and I oftentimes forget it, but some people come to a conclusion while they are talking. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and some people, when they're talking, they're telling you the conclusion but they sound, sound identical. So the one who is actually not come to a conclusion in their own mind, but they're stating it as such, is very threatening to the other person. Mm -hmm. But they don't mean to be. So, and, I, and I've counseled with people before where I have to rein in my uh, willingness or, or desire to jump in because I'm hearing them make statements. Like, wait, wait, you can't make the statement. They're stating it. But their personality is such, they're, they're just trying to get it out there, and then they're looking at it. And this is not a man-woman thing. Don't think. No. Women think this way, men think this way. That is not the case. There might be 60-40, but you'd be surprised how many uh, men think the like, opposite of what you do, and there is conflict. Uh, conflict comes when decisions need to be made, or the lead-up to decisions, the crosswords, crossroads. Excuse me. And you know why? It's because people care. It's because people care. Mm -hmm. People care about the, uh, the dinner. People care about the time. People care about the schedule. People care about the direction of a ministry. People care about what they're presenting. Most conflict comes from passion, caring, loving for the people, for the mission, for the purpose. You really care about that. Yeah. Anger and conflict are not the death of a relationship. Apathy is the death of a relationship when you stop caring. Yeah. So as long as you care, as long as there's people, you're going to have conflict. So... Conflict is inevitable, but conflict is actually good. And let me say, if you don't have conflict around ideas, you're going to have conflict around people. If you don't have conflict around ideas, you're eventually going to have conflict around people. The idea becomes then attached to a person, and now you have a problem with the person rather than a problem with the idea. Lots of people have you know, criticized a pastor, myself or whoever, for making certain decisions, especially now with schedules and stuff. And I understand that. And where I appreciate our church is most people have 
have let be settled on ideas. I didn't like the way you painted that, or I don't like the eight o'clock schedule. I don't like that you put our church, our, our family on this or that. And they made it about ideas. It's when they make it about people or a person that becomes a real problem. Um, you did it because of a secret motive. You know, Pastor King always says, you're most likely to err when you judge motives. So if you can focus on the conflict around ideas and not around people, not around why did you do that? What was your purpose? What is your motivation? Uh, it is almost impossible for you to figure out somebody else's motivation. And it is actually very difficult for you to figure out your own. Mm -hmm. So if it's hard for me to figure out my own and actually parse it all out and see black and white, this is okay, this box and that box, if it's hard for me to figure it out, yeah. it's almost impossible for me to figure out somebody else's. So it's far easier and better to just give them grace and assume they don't mean it personally, it's just an idea. Because narratives start to form around your or my perceived reality. Sure. I start to play these scenarios back in my head and I start to fill in the blanks and these stories start to form and they don't really like me and it's because they don't like my kids or they have this agenda and now I'm off to the races um, and I've, part, I've gone away from the idea that was there originally. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame Amen. unto him. James, or Proverbs 18, 13, James 1, 19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Um, and going back to our text in, first, in Ephesians chapter 4, conflict is good. You think about the, the illustration that in verse 15 and 16 that they're using, also repeated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is the, the sinews, the tendons, and the muscles, and the bone, all different. All different. One, very rigid. The bone, very, very rigid. Then you got the tendons that are a little more flexible, obviously, but not near as flexible as the muscle. All of which have to push against each other, have to pull against each other. One has to stay solid. This is where I'm going to be, and I'm never going to move. That's good. We're supposed to have that. That bone has to stay there. So it can produce power against the tendon, and the muscle also, and that produces heat, but that's how we accomplish anything. That's how we pick up a box. That's how we do all the things that we do, and those are going to be found in the ministry, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this requires, the last thing, number four, this requires the proper attitude. This requires the proper attitude. I'm going to kind of go through these fairly quickly and just trust you to apply them how you would want. Uh, so we got four things. A, uh, what's the first A? Affinity, second one. Third. Good. And then fourth is the attitude, the right attitude. Okay. So I'm going to give you a bunch of C's now, a bunch of C's. First thing is you have to have courage. You have to have courage. Um, courage. Um, basically, I mean, you can write down Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, Proverbs 15, 1 to 3, all very difficult things that you got to deal with your flesh. Okay. It's just hard. Uh, this can be un uncomfortable and difficult. And so it does take courage. And I applaud you for sticking it out. I applaud you for being part of a difficult organization because we have people. And I applaud everybody who comes together. Don't, tr don't trick yourself into saying, it should be easier. Why is it hard for me? It's hard for everybody. And you should be rewarded and uh, applauded for just sticking it out in, in any organization. Okay, I'm, I'm serious. So you have courage. Number two, communication. Communication, Micah uh, chapter number one and 2 Timothy chapter three. Communication. Communication should be number one, repeated. Repeated. And that's in 2 Timothy chapter three, verse 10 and 11. This is a fascinating verse. And it says, he's writing to Timothy and he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11. Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, uh, which came unto me in Iconium. How did Timothy possibly know all that about Paul? They must have spent a boatload of time together. Yeah. They must have spent days and days and months and months and months and always communicating. They must have, he must have mentored him almost every waking moment, to be able to say that. Could I say that about my assistants? Could I say that about my youth pastor? Could I say that about 
my wife or my children? Could I actually say that about the people that God has called me to mentor? Whoa, that's the level of mentorship. That's repeated communication. And then varied communication is Micah chapter 1. Uh, different types of communication mentioned in Micah 1 and 2, verse, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morashathite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is. You have seeing, hearing, speaking, and imagining. Because he's talking to the earth, which obviously the earth can't hear, but it's, it's uh, obviously poetic. But you've got four different types of communication there. Seeing, hearing, speaking, and imagining. Well, I told them. Maybe that's not what they connect with. I don't know. Did you show them? Did you teach them? Did you have them repeat it back? Did you? It just takes a ton of communication. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we have to publish. The service starts at 7. <laughs> Facebook, YouTube. Uh, you know, everything. And we'll always have somebody call and say, what time's it start? <laughs> That's okay. It just takes a lot of communication. Number three, caution. 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 I want you to turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Caution. Discretion. I want you to be clear that there is a difference between conflict and an actual offense. Conflict and actual offense. An actual offense presumes that there is sin. And, and, and we get it all mixed up, and, and I, uh, I, I don't want to go into all the details of this because I just don't have time. But for you to forgive somebody, you have to admit that you have been offended, and you have to, you, you have to determine that there has been guilt. Okay, We, we think, well, um, I can't forgive them because they really hurt me. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you actually can't forgive them unless they hurt you. Because that's what it says. You, you can't actually use those verses unless they were wrong, they were guilty, and you were hurt some, some way. We use it as, well, I, there's conflict, and then I'll forgive them because I'm assuming there is guilt on their part. That assuming of guilt, which actually did happen, you've determined it did happen, and that you were actually offended, and then you forgive is all part of the thing where you've already determined they were wrong and I'm right. We're talking about before all that. So have some caution, have some discretion to decide, is there actually an offense, or was it just a mistake, conflict, things that we can work out? Um, the, the Bible says in verse 15, this is the point, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, you got to stop right there and determine if there was an actual trespass, if there was an actual sin. Are they guilty? We don't know that. You haven't even talked to them. You've not given them the opportunity to answer. Great ways to start a conversation. Help me to understand. I could be wrong. This is just my perspective. Great ways to start a conversation. So you got to have some caution. And I would say give them the same grace that you give to yourself. Isn't it amazing that in the same Matthew 18, verse 8 says, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Yeah. Are you as hard on yourself as you are on them? Because that's what it says. You should be. Give them the same grace that God gives to you. Same chapter, Matthew 18, 10, 11, and 12. He left the 90 and 9 and went into the wilderness. So God had grace for you. You have grace for yourself, but we don't want to have grace for anybody else. <laughs> But that again, that is for the offense. Conflict <clears throat> is all the time, and again, it's about ideas, not people. Okay, so have some caution. Number, number the next is uh, confidence. Confidence in your own opinion. Have you ever, have you ever started, or have you ever thought with yourself, had a conversation with yourself, I'll not speak because they are so much wiser than me. They're older than me, they're smarter than me. I couldn't possibly have anything to contribute, especially the wife, hiding behind this false sense of humility. Now, this goes against God's opinion of you. I spend, and, and churches all across America will spend uh, weeks and weeks and weeks around January, February, preaching about pro-life. 
because the world's opinion of life and when it starts and the sanctity of life is completely opposite of what God's opinion is. Yep. And so we do not take the stand. This is something I, I feel precious and this is my opinion. We wholly stand on the opinion of the word of God as it is opposite from the society's opinion. We stand against homosexual marriage, abortion, evolution, all because we believe you're committing blasphemy if you do not believe God's opinion on that subject. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. And to every seed his own body I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If you say you have nothing to contribute, that is going completely against God's opinion of you. You have value for the ministry. You have value. So you have confidence in your own opinion. Uh, next one, composure. Composure. Patience. Proverbs 15, 18. Proverbs 15, 18. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Um, did you know the word mystery? Well, let me, let me say this first. Um, when you're talking through a situation, make sure that you, again, give them an out. This is my opinion. Help me to understand. Great ways to start a conversation. Help me to understand your opinion. Help me to understand your perspective. Um, be careful about filling in where they should be talking. You're already nervous, and so if your tendency to be nervous and to talk because you're nervous, you're going to fill in where they're supposed to be talking. Help me to understand what happened here. Because, you know, sometimes I don't understand things, and sometimes I make mistakes. And okay, everything good? Okay, why? And then you leave, and you're like, whew, I'm glad I talked to them. Well, all you did was really talk to them. You didn't resolve the conflict. So it's hard. Just, I'm just trying to come to a conclusion. The second thing I long to this point is, um, did you know the word mystery is found in the Bible 22 times, six times in Ephesians, three times in one verse? That means a biblical principle of graduality. That means subjects will be revealed gradually. If God deals in that, we probably assume people will deal in that. And there are some things I just won't understand about my wife. <laughs> there are things I just won't be able to put a handle on. There are some decisions, some great big events or issues I just won't be able to come to a conclusion on. And I'll just to say, we'll agree to disagree. It's a mystery. <laughs> uh, next one is courtesy. Obviously, have respect for one another. Uh, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Courtesy, 1 John 4, 7. And that produces a connection. A connection. Uh, the Bible says um, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of, love, your work of faith. Philippians 1, 8. Uh, greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. You're going you're gonna to share some passion. You're going to share some tears. You're going to share some laughter. Um, interesting thing about anger and laughter, they come from the same place. They come from unexpected outcomes. So you think this is going to happen. That's what a pun is. That's what, that's what a joke is. You think... This is going to happen, and then they say something else. You know, why is the pepper a bad archer? Because he doesn't have an arrow. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. That's an unexpected, you're like, no, we expected something dumb. And this is exactly what we got. But you know, that's what anger does too. Anger comes from unexpected outcomes, unmet expectations, same exact thing. Laughter incapacitates you. You cannot laugh breathing in. <laughs> okay? You have to stop and then breathe in and then continue laughing. So it, it, it actually incapacitates you. It, it's not good for you healthy in the sense of just maintaining your survival. Same way with anger. Anger incapacitates you. Laughter, you lose reason. 
You, you lose logic. Okay, you part of the same way with anger. Isn't it awesome that we can walk through this crazy life together <laughs> and have those relationships and we can enjoy laughter and anger sometimes and we can enjoy this together, which produces continuity, long-term long -term relationships, trust, kindness, security, forgiveness for failures. We could talk about vulnerability. We could talk about a lot of things, but uh, I hope this was a help to you as we deal with conflict. Father, love you. Thank you for the day. Thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to gather together. Bless us, I pray, as we continue on our seminar in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.